Okay, folks, thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> welcome to um, um, the Linux Fest Northwest. Um, we have Rick Kish from Microsoft with Zero Trust Security. So please go ahead. Thank you. Sure thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay. Um, Let me move Sarah the Kish. camera over. Now, where are you going to stand? Yeah, this is fine. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. I'll be right back. Awesome. Thank you. So good morning. I mean, I, I am driving from Seattle, and while coming, I did not see many people on the street, so I did not expect so many of you would show up this morning, being a Sunday. But really appreciate the enthusiasm. It kind of excites and energizes speakers like me to come back again and again and talk to you folks. So. <clears throat> Uh, in the cybersecurity industry, there has been many new trends that has been coming, and uh, Microsoft is trying to catch up on that. And one of the things is zero trust security. Uh, if you go and Google, you will see that how important it is, uh, especially from a time when the pandemic hit, people started to moving out of the offices, work from anywhere on any network, from any device. Right, and also with the re recent recession and all those things, layoffs are happening. Companies want to cut cost, and to cut cost, they are moving their applications from their own data centers to cloud. And for all of that, uh, the existing security infrastructure has a big loophole and uh, security flaw that giants like Microsoft and others are trying to um, uh, patch. Before I get into the topic and talk about the details, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm uh, born in India. I came here like seven, eight years back for studies and almost around 15 years in the tech. Um, mostly I've been working on networking and security. Uh, currently um, I'm working on a project, uh, or rather I would say a product for Microsoft where we, are, we, we just launched uh, we, uh, we said it's public preview, the general availability yet to be announced. Um, and it is about uh, enterprises like Walmart, Costco, and all those guys. They do not have so much of money to go and, you know, uh, incorporate a lot of security stuff in their uh, existing frameworks. So is there any way that we can provide security as a service? That's a new technology industry trend that is happening and Microsoft is heavily investing on that and we are coming up with a new product on security as a service. Uh, we just had a public preview. We are going to have a general availability in the next few months. And the single product itself, this is going to kind of get around projected $7 billion revenue. So how massive it's going to be, you can understand. And it's all over in the news. So I am myself uh, one of the senior technical leaders in the team trying to lead various engineering efforts for that specific product. Uh, right now I'm with Microsoft. Before that, I have been with Cisco, Dell, pretty much all networking giants. And I have worked on all sort of networking layers, starting from layer two up to layer seven. Um, fortunately, uh, uh, because of my work, I've been able to gather some awards. Uh, in 2013, I was able to crash Facebook, and uh, it was all over the news. So somehow, I am very much interested in the security and um, what's happened in the in industry. And that's especially one of the reasons I came here today to kind of connect with you folks. So thanks for coming. So about the agenda. Um, it's a very complicated topic, to be very honest. Um, don't uh, kind of try to consume it so much. What I say probably takes some notes if you can and go back and uh, look into the Google. Um, we are going to talk about what is happening, what is the problem today with the existing enterprise networks. Uh, and that, that is going to be the first topic, like why is zero trust? And then once we are convinced about the problem that we are talking about, then we talk about what exactly is the solution? What is zero trust? What does it even mean? And after that, if you are convinced, we are going to take a look at, for example, it's a Bellingham Technical College. They want to adopt the zero trust, what they have to do essentially. right? And at the end, we are going to talk about the few use cases that Microsoft's recent offering that I'm talking about that is solving and how exactly it is solving in terms of the very high level design of the, of the entire product. And at the end, we are going to talk about the benefits that one would get in learning these technologies and adopting this technology. 
Um, if you have any questions throughout this session, I would encourage you kind of note it down so that we can discuss at the end. Uh, because there could be some questions whose answers are in the next slide which you haven't seen yet. So let's have a quick Q&A session at the end of the presentation. All right, so this is a typical user to app or app to app access model today. Meaning, uh, I'm sure all of us know about what is a VPN is, virtual private network is. Um, so when we go to office, we use our badge, we sign in, then we are, by the virtue of kind of signing up with the badge, uh, we are inside the enterprise perimeter. Meaning once you enter, you are able to access more or less everything in the network. Um, and when you go back home, then essentially you use your laptop and in the laptop you have a VPN client, you go and try to sign in, it asks for your username and credentials, and then from the VPN client, all the way to the enterprise network, a secure tunnel is established. And, it's, and establishing the tunnel is a complicated process like certs, exchange, TLS, SSL connections, and whatnot, right? But essentially, after this tunnel is established, again, the same thing, you have access to the enterprise, e entire enterprise network. And once you're connected, it's just one time a trust check that happened, but after that, you pretty much have an open door to the entire network. So what is happening, if you see in the picture, right, that guy from the external network who tries to connect over VPN, he gets access to the SSH server, but because he has come through the VPN, from the SSH server, he can pretty much navigate to any other application. He can go and look into the databases. He can go and look into the web services. So that's called lateral movement, right? So because of this, we anybody who gets access to this network through VPN or by bad sign-in, they should be pretty much able to access anything in the network, right? So, this, so if I have to summarize this entire uh, process of uh, traditional user to app and app to app access, you will see one-time trust check, meaning one time you just uh, get the credentials verified, after that it's open to you. You have got excessive access. Although you wanted to access only the SSH server, but now because of this model you are able to access anything else that probably you are not intended, you, you, you are not allowed to search. You have a generic rule set, meaning if you have your laptop, you have a VPN client in that, you can pretty much go anywhere. You can, like right now, I, I brought this laptop here. I'm not at a home where probably it's a safe area. I'm in some public place. I got my VPN connected. I'm looking into the stuff. I go to the restroom and you come here and look into my laptop. And because I already have the VPN established, you're able to get access to my company resources, right? So there is, there is no such um, policies through which they will understand that, hey, actually Rakesh is not at home, not in a safe place. He's somewhere in a public place. So depending on that, I'm going to make it more stricter for him for every access he's trying to make from his laptop. There's no such thing. Moreover, VPN is a very complex uh, technology. It, uh, it, it wants you to install agents in your laptop. And then when you do that, it will do a cert exchange for the uh, TLS connections that it will establish with the VPN gateways. And um, the VPN gateways could be anywhere in the world, but it's at very specific locations, right? That means if the VPN gateway is lying in Chicago, Illinois, when I'm trying to establish the tunnel, my packet is going to go all the way to the Chicago, Illinois. Right? And then finally, maybe my intended resource that I'm trying to access is somewhere in Redmond, so then the packet is going to come back to the Redmond. So you understand that how complex this technology is. And more complex a technology means more uh, bigger surface, uh, uh, attack surface for security attacks. So what is happening now is uh, mostly after pandemic, people started moving out of this secure network. They started working from home, they started working from Starbucks, they started working from any cafeteria, basically anywhere. 
Not just that, they started using their own devices. There's a new thing called BYOD, bring your own device, meaning company is saying, I have to cut cost. And one of the ways to cut costs are to reduce the amount of money I invest in buying assets. For that, I'm going to allow you to use your own device to work on my enterprise network, right? But that has its own challenges. Then you need to go and manage those devices. If the devices are not managed, then you have a problem. You could be having um, maybe malware in your in your laptop through which you are able to you know gain entire access to the enterprise. So big challenge. So pretty much these are the things that we are seeing as a change. Work from anywhere, and when I say anywhere, meaning it could be even a vulnerable network and location. Work from any device. As I said, it's a non-corp device, meaning you could have potential malware in your device, right? Moreover, um, companies want to cut cost by moving their applications from their data centers to cloud providers, right? And when you say you're moving your applications to cloud provider, meaning your applications are not within the enterprise network anymore. It is outside the enterprise network. And then it comes another set of security challenge, right? Uh, the cloud provider would provide their own sort of security perimeters, own sort of security policies, which may not be as stricter as the enterprise wants. So all in all, these are the changes that has happened over the last four or five years in the industry where enterprises wants to go forward to. And as you understand, the existing VPN technology is not secure enough to handle these kind of issues. So simply enterprises cannot scale, right? So Microsoft has been kind of talking to customers for years now, and um, this is one of the very big ask from them, all the enterprises, people like Walmart, AT&T, Apple and whatnot, that um, uh, I want to support hybrid workforce, meaning people can work from anywhere. I cannot bring them back because of COVID. And even after COVID, people don't want to come back, right? I want to cut costs by reducing the number of assets. I want to cut costs by cutting down the data centers that I have. Now, I want to go to that era, but I don't want to invest in coming up with a new security framework. I don't have manpower, I don't have the money to spend in that, and I don't even have the knowledge. So what can I do? So um, with this feedback, uh, Microsoft looked around, and today uh, there are companies like Palo Alto Networks, they're giants on firewalls, um, Zscaler, Netscope, those are smaller startups, but they're doing great. Um, they have started a revolution based on a, a technology called zero trust network access, right? And that deemed to be something that's going to solve all the issues that I was talking about in the previous slide. We're gonna talk in detail about that. All right, I hope we are a little bit of convinced that there is a problem. If yes, uh, let's see how can we solve it. So what is zero trust? The name is interesting, like right? zero trust. I want to trust, but zero. <laughs> zero trust is nothing but a concept. Like, I don't know how many of you are aware, like software defined networking, internet of things. Those are not technologies, those are concepts. Now, you understand the basic premises of these concepts and then go and develop a technology that kind of adheres to those concepts, right? Same way, zero trust is another set of concept. Now what we are saying in zero trust is never trust. In VPN world, what is happening? You are connecting to a VPN and once it's connected, all the accesses that you're making from your laptops are allowed. Meaning one time trust check, then you are trusted. But in zero trust where you're saying, I am going, I'm going to never trust you. Meaning every access you're going to make I'm going to check that if you are the right guy. Are you trying to access from the right device? Are you in the right network? So I'm going to always doubt on you. Least privilege, meaning, as I said, 
with VPN world, or maybe when you're um, badging in the enterprise, once you're within the perimeter of the network, you can pretty much access anything. You wanted to access SSH server, but now from the server, you're able to navigate to anything, right? That has a problem. So Zero Trust says, we are going to give you least privilege, meaning you have to be very specific about what you're trying to access. I'm going to give you access only for that thing. If you need anything more, come back to me. I'm going to again validate you and then tell you that whether you're allowed or not. So it's least privilege. Third thing, assume breach, meaning even if you have authenticated ones, even if you are trying to access these resources sitting inside the company, I'm still going to assume that this is a breach. And with this assumption, I'm going to continuously going to validate that if you're the right person trying to access the right thing or not, right? So these are the basic premises of zero trust. And as you see in the first line, we are saying it's a security philosophy governed by a set of principles of never trust to deal with this modern day problem and to ensure the safety not only of the users who are trying to access, but the applications that they're trying to access and the infrastructure on top of which the application is running. All right, how to implement zero trust? So, so far we spoke about the problem that is happening today uh, with the traditional remote access framework. Then we talked about there is something called zero trust which could potentially uh, fix this issue. Um, now we are going to talk about how basically you can implement zero trust if you want to. Uh, it's a complicated process. Um, if you really want to do that, uh, you have to basically follow these four pillars. That is, you have to continuously verify the identity. Whoever is trying to access a resource, you have to verify the identity using, it could be traditional, multi uh, traditional password mechanism, or you can up-level it to things like passwordless, two-factor multi-MFA, two-factor authentications, and even these days we are doing some biometric uh, credential check, right? Could be fingerprint, could be ret retina, could be anything. But essentially, you have to verify who is trying to access, meaning, from this laptop, I have set up a VPN tunnel to the enterprise. That doesn't mean the person who is holding the laptop right now is allowed to access the enterprise. You, so whenever I'm trying to access the enterprise application, don't just trust the device, also make a credential check for the guy who is trying to access the application. So that's what verify identity. Verify access, <clears throat> okay. The device is okay, fine. The person who is trying to access this, okay, no problem. But is the person or the device really allowed to access this or not? You are able to open up secure bridge between yourself and enterprise. That doesn't mean I'm let you access everything, right? There's something called RBAC, rollback, uh, role-based access control, which traditionally we have in networking all the way. Um, it's similar to that but it's one step beyond that. Meaning, um, imagine Microsoft has come up with an enterprise application that would show the, uh, the, the, a survey uh, about um, what is the pay range in Americas, like in a certain, certain level, how much I'm going to pay a person from X to Y. But this data, I don't want to show people who are in India. So I, am, I being a Microsoft America employee, I am able to open my laptop and I am able to see this application, great. But what if I go for a vacation back at my home? I'm not allowed. So what does it mean? Meaning, it has to check which location I am searching this from or trying to get access this from. And depending on that access, the location change, then I'm going to put some policies saying that, hey, this guy is trying to access so and so thing from this place. Ideally, he is allowed, but then he is now in India in some network, so I'm not going to allow that, right? So, role based access control, RBAC, taken multiple levels 
beyond what it is what it is today. Or even giving another example, <coughs> like um, I'm I'm at, at at in the office or maybe at home, right? Again, same uh, enterprise app I opened and I'm able to see everything fine. But then I just walk next door, go to Starbucks. And what happens, my Wi-Fi changes from my office Wi-Fi or home Wi-Fi to Starbucks Wi-Fi. Now I know this is very sensitive information. This has got Microsoft confidential information. So if you're at home, it's fine. If you're in your office, it's fine. But I won't let you access this when you're in Starbucks. Now, how do I understand? So we have to verify each and every access, not just based on what that specific person is allowed to access, but based on multiple other para parameters like where, which location he is coming from, which network he is using, is it a vulnerable network or not. So we are going to kind of ver verify each and every access. That's what the second topic is. And then we are talking about verify devices. Now that we are talking about BYOD, bring your own device, uh, we are talking about devices which are not provided to you by your college or by your um, uh, enterprise, meaning they are not managed. So how do you make sure that it has got the right security patches? The OS is not lagging behind because of which there is a malware attack that could happen. How do you make sure that, right? How do you make sure that once you, using this device, you establish a connection with the enterprise. After that, there is another software running in your device that is able to sniff that data and then kind of leak it. How do you know? So you have to verify the device also, and you have to and you have to make sure that all the compliance check that is happening, right, um, that is needed, all those things are uh, in place. And last but not the least. Continuous validation of these. What does it mean? I'm sure we have heard about uh, long-lived uh, connections uh, in the context of, let's say, uh, you open google.com, right? And when you open google.com from your laptop, you establish a TCP connection to, um, to the server. And it's pretty much kind of a request response kind of a framework. But when you open LinkedIn, then it's not a request response framework. It's pretty much a WebSocket thing, meaning it's a bi-directional. That means even without refreshing the page, you should be able to see that new updates coming in. How does it happen? There's a long-lived connection that is established between your laptop and all the way to LinkedIn server. And when I say long-lived connection, meaning these connections have a longer age. It stays for quite some time. And the problem with this infrastructure is that when you have a long-lived connection, then the moment you step away from your laptop and somebody else access to it, or if there is a, a software, other software that is installed in your laptop is able to get access to that connection, then they pretty much can get inside the enterprise network and access whatever they want, right? So what we're going to do is that even though the connection is established and and before being established we did the credential check still we are going to validate each and every access within that connection meaning once the connection is established between myself and linkedin server i would not assume that the the connection is fine and anything happens inside the connection is okay no i would not assume rather Within the connection, if I'm saying linkedin.com slash people, again, I'm saying linkedin.com slash whatever feed. For every request, I'm going to uh, make a credential check. Now, people ask me that, what it means that uh, a bad customer experience, right? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we try to optimize it by storing the password and do m multiple things. But yeah, it's bad, a little bit bad, not so bad. Um, but it's not so bad because in 2021, there was a colonial ransomware attack. What happened in that attack is um, the, the transport system of, of uh, United States, which trans transports the fuel, uh, that got attacked. 
and how it got attacked because of one person's <coughs> password leak uh, through their VPN tunnel. And what was the impact of that? Uh, 17 states said, I cannot transport fuel because my operation system is down. And they announced emergency. Then FBI ended up paying $4.1 million to the ransomware attack. So if you think about these impacts, then a little bit of not so happy customer experience is okay because security is at stake. All right. So now, um, this, is, this was the technology I was talking about, right? Now the real implementation meaning, um, what are the big giants like Microsoft, Palo Alto Networks, Zscaler, Netscope they are doing? They came up and said that, hey, this is a cool thing that is going to solve your issue, and we understand this is eminent. It is required. You cannot just go away from it. So there's a business opportunity. But the thing is, you don't have money, knowledge, um, yeah, you don't want to spend a lot on operation, what would you do? Let me make a cloud offering, or some kind of an offering, could be cloud, could be something else, where you need to make zero change to your enterprise network, in your applications, you don't have to make any change, right? All you need to do, I will give you some apps, install in your devices, install in your data center, that's it. But you don't need to do anything else. We are going to intercept your packets and then we are going to give you security, right? All you need to do is probably give me some monthly subscription. I'm going to maintain it. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to make sure that we are up to date with all the security attacks that's happening. So you don't have to worry about anything. You just worry about installing certain agents in the devices from where you're going to, uh, you're going to uh, access the enterprise. And also another regime that I will give you to install in your data center so that it gets connected to my service, right? So don't worry about anything else. And then we call, the, we name that as SASE, Secure Access Service Age. It's a cloud architecture model that combines network and security as a service, functions together, and delivers them as a single cloud service. And this is happening for the very first time in the industry. It never existed before. All right, how are we doing on time? We have time. All right, so this is what we are doing about in, in Microsoft. So, so far, what we are talking about theory, right? But in reality, this is how it looks like. So on your very left side, these are the laptops, your iPads, and all those endpoints through which you want to access. What is there all the way right? that is all your applications and resources, right? Where are the applications hosted? It could be in enterprise's own uh, data center, what we call it on-prem or on-premises. It could be even in some public clouds that they would have chosen to uh, host their application in AWS, Azure, or GCP, anywhere, right? <coughs> now, today, the Connectivity between the left and right is simple, straight. There's a VPN tunnel in between. What we are saying is that I'm going to come in between. So that's the middle box. I'm going to come in between and I'm going to intercept all your packets. How will I do that? Um, so it doesn't matter which device you are using and who is using uh, that device. Whenever they are trying to access any enterprise resources, then I'm going to give you an agent, like a VPN client, right? Same thing, an agent that you have to install in this device. And that device, that uh, agent, uh, is going to intercept those packets. Because there's no that this specific URL, for let's take an example, let's say Walmart is our customer, or Bellingham Technical College is our customer, right? And they are saying, I have tons of applications lying in my uh, data center in one of the labs, I want to secure it. And the applications are accessed through URLs, right? So they gave us the URLs. So what, what we're going to do for all the students and the teachers and staff, for everyone, we're going to say that download this specific agent in your laptop. And in the agent, I'm going to feed the URLs 
belonging to the applications that BTC is hosting. Now the moment you're using your laptop or any device to try to access this BTC application, this agent knows, oh, okay, this packet is for that BTC application, which is supposed to be secure. So it's going to intercept that packet. The moment it intercepts, after that it will say, okay, now my job is to secure this packet and see that if it's, if it's correct or not. Because BTC had paid me money, that's what my job is. So I'm going to make sure that this access that device is trying to make is to be allowed or not allowed, right? I'm going to validate that. Now to validate that, this agent is first going to establish a tunnel all the way to one of the edge routers of the Microsoft VAN. Microsoft is a big VAN, right, uh, for the cloud network that it has. And around the perimeter of this VAN, they have got edge routers. All the edge services are, are lying on top of that. So it's going to establish um, a connectivity, a channel, all the way to this edge router. Now inside this edge router, that's where our magic sauce lies. That's called ZTNA stack, right? Zero Trust Network Access stack. Now inside the stack, one of the core component is a proxy. I'm saying reverse proxy here. Reason being proxies has two different flavors. Um, forward proxy and reverse, uh, reverse proxy. Um, when the proxy is nearer to the user who is trying to access outside, then it's called forward proxy. When the proxy is nearer to the host, what we are trying to access, that's called reverse proxy, right? Now in this case, um, we are trying to um, access the apps which are all the way in the right square bottom, right? And we are trying to secure it. So we are closer to the apps, the hosts, or there are other terms in, 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 the, in our world called origins, right? So that's why we are calling it reverse proxy. Examples of reverse proxies are uh, Nginx, Envoy. These are multiple uh, available in the, in, the, in the market. So that proxy, the role of that proxy is to essentially look into the packet, inspect its headers all the way from IP to application, depending on whatever policies you want to uh, put there, right? It's going to inspect the packet and then make sure that depending on what it has, like if, if the, the five tuple, the uh, source IP, destination IP, all those things, right? Uh, the, is, it, is it belonging to a correct uh, location through which this is supposed to be accessed? That there could be a bunch of, bunch of things that could be there in the, in the packet, right? So it is going to inspect that packet and make sure that the packet is allowed to be taken to the next step. Um, moreover, when these devices are establishing this tunnel and then there is a credential check, username, password, after the credential check, um, a token is going to be assigned to these devices. Um, and this token kind of identifies their context, meaning what are they supposed to access, what they're not supposed to access, right? What region is coming from and whatnot. And this token is going to kind of be their key uh, to access, get access to the application they're trying to access to, right? So in summary, from the left box, from the devices, to the edge of the Microsoft van, which is the small little uh, black box in the middle portion, right? They're going to be a secure tunnel established, and then the small little box is going to validate that specific access. If it say things that, no, this is not the right user, not right device, then it is going to say, just go away. What happens is that uh, you're going to fail fast. In VPN technology, you're going to go all the way to a VPN gateway problem in Chicago, Illinois, and then it's going to say that, hey, you know, your credentials are not good, so go back. But now these edges, with their name, you can understand it's edges, right? Meaning it's, it's, it's edge of the network, it's close to you. You're going to fail fast if you are really not allowed to access the enterprise application. And if you're allowed to uh, access the enterprise application, then this big box that we're talking about, that's the cloud service that we're providing, that is going to 
uh, forward your request all the way to the applications wherever they host it. It could be in an uh, enterprise data center or it could be public data center, right? Now the question is, how would Microsoft know that where uh, BTC's uh, data centers are or where in which lab uh, DTC has hosted uh, these applications, right? So what BTC has to do when they have a let's say little server on top of that they host this application, they also have to install another agent that we will provide. And that agent is going to establish a tunnel back to the service. So you see on the right hand side a big fat greenish kind of an arrow. So the BTC server is going to establish an outbound connection all the way to this Microsoft Cloud service and register themselves and keep heart beating, meaning saying, hey, I'm still alive, hey, I'm still alive. So that when Microsoft service, the DNA service, receives packets for the specific applications, they know exactly that which lab or which IP address uh, of the server where they want to forward this uh, uh, request, right? <clears throat> so by doing this, what are we achieving? Uh, BTC doesn't need to invest a single penny into changing their enterprise application. They don't need to do anything. Um, they don't need to tell any device owners that, hey, you know, you, don't, you cannot use this device or I need to do this with the device, nothing. They just need to hand over a small exe. Go and install the CXC. Um, in turn, they're making sure that they are able to expand their network beyond their reach. Meaning, if today BTC has this campus and they want to, let's say, have another campus in Seattle, and then you know there's a campus to campus connections and there are a lot of security things coming in within the campus they need to establish security across the campuses they need to, they don't need to worry about all that all they need to do is that host applications in any server in any campus and just install an exe that is going to point their applications to microsoft cloud service so simple right and the pillars of zero trust Verify at the very bottom you see right. I've written it down Verify explicitly meaning verify every access every user every device Use least privilege and assume breach. These are the three basic pillars of ZTNA that you're getting Not free, but free in terms of the there's no capital expense there No, there's no operational expense there probably you monthly pay a little bit of fee uh, through which you're getting everything from uh, a credible company like Microsoft and others who are who are very um, knowledgeable in that. All right, so what we talked about in the previous slide, if you see at the very top right, Microsoft Entra private access. These two <coughs> words, private access, meaning uh, we are trying to access some private applications. As I said, BTC has some uh, some applications, let's say for students or for whatever, right? Um, those are the private application. But what if says BTC says that, okay, uh, I also want to secure um, accesses to rest of the internet so that they don't go and probably download some unusual stuff and then the devices are affected, that kind of comebacks and bites me up, right? I don't want to do that. So uh, secure me from the internet access also, right? So that's what we call Microsoft Internet, uh, Entra Internet Access. So essentially, back in December, we launched these two flavors of the product called Microsoft Entra Network Access. One is the Microsoft Entra Private Access for all the private applications that enterprise hosts. Another thing is called Microsoft Entra Internet Access for the rest of the internet. And it's pretty much the same, the previous and this diagram. The only thing is different is the very right hand side box. As you see here, we are uh, basically trying to access anything in the internet plus all the Microsoft 365 applications that's hosted in our um, cloud services, right? Like for example, um, Microsoft Word Doc. We provide it as a cloud service where you can just pay a subscription fee end of the month and then and then you can use uh, Microsoft Word hosted in a uh, cloud service. Right? Um, and we want to make sure that we, we are able to provide you secure access 
to those applications to, uh, through your laptop. So how do we do that? So this is what it is. So anyway, uh, the, the, the main critical difference between um, what I talked before versus what, it, what I talked about talking now is that for internet access, you don't know what you're going to try to access. So in private access, you know that there's a server in BTC. You, you know where it is hosted. You go and install an application, and that application kind of establishes connectivity to the Microsoft Cloud service. You know, right? But in internet, you don't know. You can access Google, you can access LinkedIn, you can access anything else. So where all will you go and say that, hey, Google, establish a connectivity with me so that when a packet comes for you, I'm going to uh, look into it if it's right or wrong. You cannot do that, right? So essentially for network internet, Microsoft Entry internet access, there is no such concept of a host establishing a connectivity back to the Microsoft Cloud service we are talking about. Instead, um, the proxy is going to do the magic, uh, the proxy that I was talking about, right, in the, in the edge it's hosted. So that's going to do the magic about finding out the, finding out the URL uh, which it is trying to go uh, and access to and looking into if it's a TLS packet for example it is going to look into the, um, uh, the TLS headers, unwrap the packet and see that what exactly it is trying to access and based on that URL it is going to talk to another service we call it web categories meaning depending on the kind of URL you're trying to access uh, what type it is. It's a social network access or it's a, it's a gaming site so depending on that, we kind of categorize those URLs and then we say, okay, this specific category is allowed. This specific category is not allowed. So we do all sort of policies in the proxies itself and block right there. And if it is allowed because it is allowed, maybe it's it's social network, it's not allowed, but if the news site is allowed, then we just go and forward it. And the URL just takes you through the real server where it's been hosted, right? All right. So I think we have 15 minutes more, right? Um, we would like um, a little bit of time for the next presenter to get ready. So sure. So how um, much time? A I have? little bit before. before 55? So, <laughs> um, 50? 50? Okay, let's try. Okay, I'm going to quickly. If you, if you can. Okay, let, let um, me try. Yeah. 55, um, um, if not. Um, Sure, I want to give some time for question answers. So let's spend two minutes on this and then we quickly kind of have a discussion, right? Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, it was a lot. Sorry about that. So uh, if possible, I'm going to share some documents with the organizers. Or maybe you can, I can I, you will see my email ID, right? You can reach me out. I can send you a lot of documents around it. So it's, it's a heavy concept. Um, but it has got a lot of learning opportunity. I don't know what kind of audience we have today. If, if there are students, for example, you have a lot of learning opportunity in terms of what is VPN, what is proxy, what is happening in the industry. And for non-students, uh, could be professors out here or, or somebody from the uh, industry, uh, it's a great opportunity to learn what is trending in cybersecurity, what uh, enterprises are really looking for. and where giants like Microsoft are heavily investing, right? So that's a good thing to learn. Um, I'm going to end this session uh, by talking about few benefits. In the interest of time, I would just quickly just uh, skim through it. Um, I hope you probably understand by this time that um, this provides you good user experience, meaning you can have your applications hosted in your server or maybe in the cloud, there are two different kind of ways of accessing it, uh, two different security posture. But now, your pack, all the packets that you goes to your applications are going through a cloud service given by Microsoft or somebody else. So it's a sim single way of uh, securing your applications. So basically, enhanced user experience. Enhanced security, because of all the reasons that we talked about, reduced capital expenses and operational expenses, uh, just to uh, remind you there, VPN is a hardware-based solution and it is very expensive to maintain it even if somebody wants to keep it. Whereas this solution we are talking about is a cloud-based service. It's a pure software-based solution, very easy to maintain. Uh, because somebody is inspecting all your packets, you get a 
great amount of observability in a single uh, pane of window, meaning you open one uh, user uh, GUID that you say that, hey, what access has happened? How many unsecure access has happened? How many packets I blocked uh, last month? All those things comes in a single pane of window. So uh, a great observability. Seamless scalability, uh, you expand your campus. You don't have to worry about the security. All you need to do is route your packets through me. I'm going to take care about the security. So for you, seamless scalability. You as in the enterprises, right? Low latency, high throughput. Meaning, as I said, with a VPN gateway, it's a hardware-based solution. The hardware would be fixed in some locations, right? And no matter where you're uh, trying to get access to the enterprise application firm, your request is going to go to that fixed set of hardware VPN gateways. Whereas in this model, your requests are going to go to the edges, meaning it's much closer to you. So it's very high latency uh, access, and you're going to fail fast, right? All right. Uh, we can spend probably five minutes. Uh, question answer? Um, yeah, until the next question. Yeah, answer. that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anything uh, you guys want to ask, uh, I would be happy to answer. Uh, do you guys do SSL decrypt for the traffic? We do because um, we need to know, right, what is there inside you're trying to access, so we do, yeah. <clears throat> I'm more of uh, more Colin's observation. It was, I think I noticed this uh, enhanced security coming along, and it was a real pain in the wazoo to use it until I got the fingerprint access on the phone and also on the laptop because. It keeps prompting for the security. For example, every time I want to get access to my GitHub, I've got to uh, provide the, uh, you know, my, my, my password and, and yep. my uh, verify who I am. Yeah. And it's pretty much everything's like that now. LinkedIn, yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, you should probably think that the applications which are not doing that are the ones that may not be as secure. Yeah. I mean, this is what multi-factor authentication is, right? I think traditionally before, we were not exposed to the kind of security attacks we are seeing these days. And that kind of prompted us to rethink what we are doing. Um, username and password, I, I always used to save. Like, you know, you put it in Gmail and in Google, Chrome pops up and said, you want to save it? I used to save. And and it's saved in a pretty uh, like static text, meaning you can actually go and check what it is saved, right? That means if your laptop is hacked, your all applications are, kind of, uh, like all username and passwords are stolen. Versus if it is multi-factor authentication, meaning you're giving your username and password saved in your laptop, but again, I'm going to ask you to uh, give me an OTP that comes to your phone that ensures that even if your saved passwords or credentials are leaked, you still have to not have an access. And I think, as I said, like with the fancy security attacks happening these days, uh, security is becoming complex, but it is becoming secure. <laughs> that, that's all I can say. I was interested in hearing some of your perspective on the, we talk about ZTNA and we talk about uh, implementing zero trust policies, uh, in particular to support BYOD. Uh, however, the common complaint that I've heard from a lot of people in various IT organizations that I speak to uh, is that it increases the burden on IT to help aid such a diverse pool of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that Microsoft with this product is encouraging BYOD or just supporting the business case that's there? Because to me, it still seems like what is an appropriate enterprise security strategy still involves not only implementing trust policies, but also specifically restricting them to company-owned devices rather than personal ones so that yeah. you can have a more secure perimeter. Not that you're trusting them, but you're saying, I just don't trust anything that isn't company level. Yeah, good question. So actually, we do support BYOD meaning from my phone, I'm able to access uh, the chat, the email, bare minimum, right? It could be even more than that. How I'm able to do that? There are agents installed in my laptop. 
uh, which is kind of managing the device, it's pain. For sure, it's a pain, meaning it's going to intercept your packet, even if you're chatting to some other friend, it's still going to intercept That's all that. Problem. Yeah, I, I know. That's why many people go and un uninstall it. But the thing is, this technology is enabling you to use that. Whether you want to use that or not, that's a different thing, right? Um, yeah, I understand. It's not very friendly, uh, but there are companies who are not Microsoft, who don't have that much money in the pocket, who wants to have people to use their own laptops. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, we can talk outside also if you guys want. So, yeah, thank you so much.